This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Keep Podcast with Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephen Van Tassel, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. So really glad to have you on board. Hey, take a few moments subscribe to the channel make sure you ring the bell there so you get notifications of how our podcast is uh, coming out each time we're glad to have you on board if you have comments criticisms suggestions for new shows definitely reach out to me at wildlife control consultant at gmail.com wildlife control consultant at gmail.com well, today we have sort of a legend in the insect world, but we, uh, you say, well, you don't do insects, Stephen, you're a vertebrate guy. Yes, but there's been, there's a little bit of overlap in terms of uh, the pest control world when it comes to stinging insects. And we have uh, Eric McCool. He is the owner of Critter McCool Management Group. He's the president and owner of that organization. You can check him out at crittermccool.com. That's C-R-I-T-T-E-R-M-C. C O O L dot com. And his company manages, does four different things. We have stinging insect removal. He has a pest, pest control museum. So if you have some old artifacts that you want to make sure you hold for posterity to show the history of this in our country, definitely hold them aside. He would be definitely interested in those. He has a training arm where if people are interested in learning more about bee extractions and stinging insect controls and of course bee extract honey bee extractions as well so uh welcome aboard eric really glad to have you here hey good afternoon thank you for having me it's a pleasure uh being a guest on your show and uh we go back we probably 30 years you were you, you know? were saying that you have a letter of mine from 1989 or something it's like oh my gosh yeah that goes it is uh that's a lot of water under the bridge since that time yeah, sure. sure is, yeah. it's been a long time well you've had a long and storied career here why don't you tell people a little bit about just kind of give a summary of you know how you got started in stinging insect control uh you know bee extractions something you're famous you had all these you know, you've been very active on social media, showing people different things that you're doing and how many stings that you've gotten at times. Uh, so why don't you tell about how you got into that? Yeah, so um, I've been doing this my entire working career. Um, so at the age of 12, I used to go to a uh, summer camp in the woods. And uh, one of my first interactions with stinging insects was um, there was a group of eight or 10 of us walking a path in the woods and uh, one of my friends actually threw a rock at a bald-faced hornet's nest and uh, broke it open and the hornets came down and, and stung him many many times he was transported to the hospital and uh, no one else in the group got stung and I thought that was very fascinating that I'm like wow this is very cool that these insects knew somehow that you know he was the one that uh threw the rock and so uh, i went back home i actually lived in a housing project um when i was younger in a low-income um, housing project and uh, they had animals all the time because they uh it was in the middle of the woods in the middle of nowhere and so they had a lot of animals around the dumpsters and stuff so at the age of 12 the management i was always out doing things and stuff like little country boys would do mm -hmm. and uh, i didn't have a background of a being a fur trapper i didn't have a father, father in the picture or anything like that so um the management came to me and they said can you help take care of any of these animals and i said sure you know you got your basic raccoons and your in your skunks and and uh a fox from time to time and i was 12 years old and i said okay let me uh let me see what I can do. So uh, one night I was walking around one of the dumpsters and there was a skunk. And so unfortunately at that time, I was 12 years old, you know, early, late eighties there. Um, so I stoned the skunk to death. And I said, that was pretty easy, you know, a little stinky, but pretty easy. 
So I went to the management and told them that I could take care of the problem at the age of 12. Of course, it wasn't a business and, and all that. So they would pay me in ice cream sandwiches for every animal that I would kill. So uh, I said, man, that's fantastic. You know, free ice cream for me and my friends um, for me to go kill animals. I thought that was great. So um, I did that for about a year. Um, and so it started involving a little more and, and I was getting quite a few animals there. So the Pennsylvania Game Commission um, who regulates the animals in the state of Pennsylvania uh, approached me and said, um, that they was going to cite me for being cruelty to animals mm. for them to death. Right. And so that was actually a big blessing in my career because I'm like, okay, let's go with relocation instead of killing everything on site. And so uh, I did that for another year. Um, and so when I got to 14, um, I did that for two years for the ice cream sandwiches. At 14, one of my uh, family friends had red squirrels in the, in the wall. Mm -hmm. And he says, I'll pay someone to get rid of red squirrels. And I lived in a very rural area of Pennsylvania. So there wasn't no wildlife control people even right. across the United States a whole lot. Yeah, even. Pretty early yeah. in the industry at that point. Yep. Yeah. So um, he went to work. I smashed a huge hole in his in his wall, huge wall, and found the red squirrels. And I don't know if mama was ever there, but I grabbed the young and got the got the nest out and he gave me twenty dollars. And so I said, okay, there's here's a career now. I got twenty dollars and a box of ice cream sandwiches. What can I do with this? Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, so I started just doing it a little bit more. When I turned 16, um, I kind of thought this is what I need to do for a living. You know, I love bees. I love, I love wildlife. And uh, I just thought this was the cat's meow in a sense to do. So I said, okay, how can I start a business? So I actually quit high school. I went to the bank with a little business plan I just made up. And I said, I need $10,000 to start a wildlife control business to catch animals. And they just laughed at me. I mean, it so I sat down with some family friends and I said, I want to catch animals for a living. And they're like, there's no way, no way. You know, everybody just shoots them, poison them or leaves them alone. So I said, okay. So I did a roofing job, made a hundred dollars. I went out and with $75 of that money, um, I bought my first business license, mercantile license for the city. And I bought my first cage trap, still have my cage trap. Wow. Um, so I became, you know, most people in the wildlife control industry, they have a fur taking background, mm -hmm. trapping background. Yeah. I started with cage trapping right off the bat. So um, one of the first things I had to establish is, okay, cell phones wasn't even out then. So mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, how do I, how do I even begin to do this? So I had a pretty humbling um start here you know i i would write people you know there was only like you and uh tim julian and yeah. a couple others in the industry that i even heard of so i would write you say how much should i charge and how much should i do this and my sir my first service fee was 15 dollars. Yeah. you know 15 dollars. i look back and i'm like most guys even in the bigger cities they're charging two, three, four hundred dollars for a service call fee, yeah. uh, or emergency fee, and I was charging fifteen dollars, you know. So here I am six, fifth, 16 years old. Um actually I have this here. Oh, One of my wow. flyers. Nice. Look at that. You're called yeah. M's. Oh and M's Wildlife Pest Control. That is yeah. that is awesome. Yeah. Eric McCool's uh wildlife yeah. control. And then this is all handwritten. Yeah, I see that. And this is this skunk here is copy and paste. So I cut it out of a magazine and, yeah. and paste on there and there. So that is how, cool. That's the humbling beginning there. That's right. Yeah. Well, you know, you have you to know, start uh, somewhere, but I mean, that's, yeah. uh, I, I think you just emphasize that one advantage of the wildlife control field is that the, the buy ins pretty low. 
um, in the certain, you know, it's, it's getting a little higher now because more states are regulating, but we you know when you were starting and, and I was starting, it was, there wasn't a lot. It's not like you had to go through all these courses and take exams and then, you know, get in. So the buy-in is pretty low, but the learning curve can be a bit, can be a bit tough. <laughs> oh yeah. Learning curve. I struggled there for quite a long time. So I didn't get my driver's license um, till I was 19. So here I am making money at 16 years old. I quit school, started my own company, okay? So um, I bought my own car, and I would pay my friends to drive me to my job sites. Oh, my goodness. And so they would drive me to my job sites, drop me off. I would perform services, and when I was done, I would carry my tools and walk up to a payphone and call them oh to, come, gosh. to come to pick me up. Wow. So that, I mean, that's humbling. That's very, you know, so um, when I turned 19, I did that for a couple of years, um, just paying my guys, my, my friends to drive me around to, to my own jobs. So why didn't you get your license sooner? If at, you know, nine, you could have gotten a driver's license at 18 or probably even 17, I would think in most states. Actually, the state of Pennsylvania is 16. Right. Um, but when I was uh, 14, 15 there, um, doing trapping and stuff. So I actually was cited for driving without a license. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Because you don't always have a friend to drive you to the job site. Right. Yeah. yeah. I was, that's my car. I could drive that. <laughs> so I actually, uh, you know, to be quite honest, I, I drove myself to the job site. I got busted a couple of times for driving without yeah. license. Okay. $250 fine and they suspended you for a year. Right. So okay. that's how it was. You know, three times I got pulled over. Oh, that is, I, that is amazing. Never knew. Yeah. That is just, so what, where did this drive come from? I mean, you, you sort of, I mean, what, how, your, did your mother have, a, she must've been like, who, who is my son here? Where did this drive come from? I mean, this is amazing. Yeah. So 16 was really life changing for me because I quit high school. Right. I found I found a free tutor to help me get my GED. Mm -hmm. She was actually a veterinarian. So mm -hmm. she kind of helped me instill a little bit there as well. Um, I actually moved out of my mom's house when I was 16. I moved in with a, a uh, woman that I actually ended up spending 16 years with. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, life right then was pretty, pretty crazy. Okay. You know? And so uh, when I got my license at 19, I started just, pushing a little more so it was funny because the way I looked at life then um, I had at 19 I was having my first child so when I would purchase things Stephen I would look at if I had to buy groceries you know I'm like that's 13 raccoons two groundhogs and a chipmunk you know I would picture in my head how many animals I would have to catch how much work Right. that is you know so you know that that new tool that i needed might not might have been a want and not a need you know right. if i had to do that so i did that for a few years you know everything i did i'm like yeah that's three groundhogs it's, it's not worth it <laughs> you know because they're a pain in the butt to trap yeah you know? you know that you know you're exactly you're exactly right so when did you make a transition to more the stinging insects when did that occur in your business yeah, you know, so I, I was doing wasp nests and, and little yellow jacket nests mm -hmm. and stuff. The entire time I was doing wildlife control work. So it really involved in two, 2000. I was doing a lot more jobs. And in 2000, um, I did a big job. And then I went to Florida, did a little bit of removal work and, and worked with another fellow in Florida in 2000. And so I was, I was doing probably 35% of my business was bee work then. 35, wow. Yeah. And so in 2005, um, I did a high, a big high profile case. It was all over the internet, you know, it went viral. It was on CNN and, and everything like that, made a couple magazines. And so 2005, it really like flip flopped. So it went from. 35% B work to 
to 35% animal work and the rest would be work now. Mm-hmm. That's 2005. And so I said, well, I looked across my area and then I looked across the industry and I'm like, no one's really talking about stinging insects. Nobody's performing services the way I, and so I took that base as again, is I was more of a conservationist and more of a location guy. Mm-hmm. You know, I put down if I had to by state law requirements, right. but um, I kind of took that base with the with the stinging insects. I'm like, okay, how can I work this area, and you know, in a sense, avoid getting a license or an applicator's license. You know, right. okay. so at that time, I was like, you know, let's let's perform live removal. And uh, I remember very, very well that people in the industry and in my neighborhood and all that said, there's no way people will pay you for live bee removal. You know, just nobody will do that. You've heard that a few times, it sounds like. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It seems like they keep being wrong. (laughs) And so, you know, that's where I'm at now. Like, people, you know, and so I thought I wanted that to be a tool in a toolbox for the pest and the wildlife control industry. You know, they always look at treat, 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 kill, kill, kill. So I just, at first, I wanted that just to be an option. Hmm. You know, leave it alone or do a live removal. And uh, now I'm to the point that I want that the first to be the first option. Let's go, let's go integrated pest management instead of, you know, just kill, kill, kill. You know, let's Let's look at, you know, relocation, live removal, IPM versus if we have to, let's kill them. So. Do, you, do you think there was a change uh, when when greater concern occurred with the fate of the honeybee? That a lot that that helped you sell that to your clients. You know, let's not kill that hive in your wall. Let's try to do a live removal. Do you think that background information about the plight of the honeybee helped sell that live removal? Um, I, I definitely think it helped. I don't think it helped a, a great deal. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that most people don't realize is this is the third kill off, if you want to say, of the honeybees in this country in the last 70 or 80 years. You oh, know? I didn't know that. Okay. So the last time was in the mid 70s. Um, there was a big scare, you know, honeybees was dying off and, and uh, it, it rebounded and, and, and so forth. So honeybees. This is where I kind of conflict with a lot of people is honeybees are not native to this. Right. This right. Okay. So a lot of people think, you know, why they are so important to us is because man makes money off them. So mm-hmm. because they make a profit, they're, they become priceless to us. Right. So what is happening though is everybody wants to be a beekeeper and they're not planning enough food sources. So what we're doing is everybody wants becomes a beekeeper queen bee lays 2,000 eggs a day and everybody wants to pollinate everything we're actually starving out all the native bees right. so if you, yeah. i've heard if, that yeah if you look at the bumblebees and the other species they're going to decline because you're moving two million bees into an area starving that area out and leaving and so the, that's still stuck there have nothing to, to eat you know mm. so um you know, is it getting better? Absolutely. Did that source help? Yes. Um, I think educating the client in any service is probably the most important thing you can do. So once you start explaining, hey, you know, this nest can become a fire hazard, it could stink and rot and cause odors, mm-hmm. the honey can leak, turns the sugar, attracts other rodents and insects. I mean, you, you could just go on and on, and they're like, oh, just mm-hmm. take it out. Right. You know, let's take it out. So, uh, yeah, I think everybody wants to become a little bit more greener and safer um, as the time goes by, most yeah. definitely. Given the struggles you had in your early years, uh, what advice would you give for someone who's, you know, they're work, trying to work their own business? Obviously, you started in very difficult circumstances in a rural environment, which is a very tough area to start a wildlife control business because everyone just kind of shoots it out the window or whatever. What kind of, what sort of tips kept you going 
that you could give to someone else who's listening to the show at this particular point? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I did is was almost a mistake for me is I, a lot of these companies try to grow too big, too fast. Growth, growth is important, but it can, it can be devastating if it's done incorrectly or too fast. And so that's something I tried to do right off the bat is I was like, Ooh, I need this and I need this. And I thought I need a letter truck up and, and all that. So you can get yourself in trouble very quickly. Uh, grow the business, you know, almost in a sense as slow as you can and, and uh, it will grow on its own. You know, mm. um, one of the things that I did is cause I didn't have a fur, tr- fur taker background or anything like that. Um, every year I added a new animal. And what I meant by that is like, I started with skunks. So that gave me a whole year to concentrate just on learning that species, learning how to trap it, bait it, relocate. And then the following year I would add raccoons. And so each year, you know, the company grew, but it gave me enough time to learn that species and not get overwhelmed. And uh, I'm a firm believer of paying cash for everything i'm a i'm an old school guy so uh nobody can say hey i helped build him or mm-hmm. you know if you can't make that loan payment or something or winter kicks in so i've been a firm believer of paying cash for everything so don't buy it unless you can afford it you know okay well that's good i think that's good advice so using that same principle then for someone who's a wildlife control operator and they're looking to get into uh, the insect area, the stinging insects, I'm using that as an umbrella term. Do you have uh, advice on which species of stinging insect they should start with or which group class of stinging insects? Probably should honeybees be last and maybe do the wasp nests and hornet's nests first? Do you have any Actually, advice? That's, on that? a, that's a great idea. Um, our number, number, our top services are probably yellow jackets and honeybees. Okay. But with that being said, um, honeybees are probably the most difficult um, and hardworking and, and, and the liability is really high. Yeah. Um, cutting in the structure just because structural beams, you know, you got insulation, plumbing, heating, um, there's so much different things. And I actually, you know, later in my career, I took a home, home inspector's course and I took a, a uh, contractor's course and then I was in the fire service for 20 years as well. So I, I took all of them things to help me build that, the wildlife work on right, how, right. you know, and that's very important. Um, species wise, yeah. I mean, start with your hornets, you know, any, any of your hornet species, they're probably the easier ones. Um, your wasps, um, bumblebees, carpenter bees, and yellow jackets next and then honeybees as your last service last one now do you do those wasp nests do you do those without pesticides do you just grab them uh to just remove them without pesticides or do you at all or do you recommend using pesticides how what is your process on that yeah so um i've been chemical free well i call it chemical free Mm -hmm. i use no no use of any um pesticides or insecticides never have never will um that's just my belief. Sure, no, no. That's sell your sell your method without a doubt. Yeah, I'm not against pesticides. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that um, I just started doing within the last couple of years is people say um, they didn't want to talk to me because I don't use pesticides. So <laughs> I looked at yeah. So what I looked at is all these videos on YouTube and different things and people treating nest incorrectly. Mm. You know. They're, they're causing their self more safety issues or liability or the dust is blowing back on their face and just so many different things. So I created a course to teach technicians and owners how to treat nests properly. You know, mm-hmm. um, some people are using half a pound or a pound of dust um, on a nest. And I'm like, what? <laughs> That's so much. And then they leave the nest. You know? And so... Mm. Uh, yeah it's just that's crazy on and and you know i have to look at it now as i'm ordering in in the industry here that um i used to get mad at those 
type of people right, that I'm like, right. what are you doing? Why idiots and different things? And now, uh, I guess my fate has got me, you know, in my old age here. Mm-hmm. That, um, a lot of these guys just don't have the knowledge or the experience, you know, right. just haven't got their the train the correct training. So they're actually trying to provide the best service they they can, but that's all they know. So right. can't really be ignorant about it, but um, yeah, they just need to have training. So that's why I created a course. The, this is how you treat a nest. You know, I prefer you to do a live removal, but if you have to do a treatment, mm-hmm. this is how you do it correctly. Yeah. So talk about your training course. Is this, uh, do they have to come to your facility? Is it online? How do they get a hold of this training course? Yeah. So um, we just started some online courses. They're extremely limited. Um, okay. I'm, not, I'm not a, very techie guy and online guy. I like to be, I like to shake hands and uh, see people face to face. I do a lot of conferences and classes. Um, I do ride alongs. Um, you could do a ride along with me, or I can come and ride along with you. Um, I do classes on site in your town, your city, your office. Um, I do a lot of consulting and training now for, we just did a, a office for Truly Nolan. Um, I got one in Georgia here is coming up. So I do a lot of training and and consulting on site. Now, the nice thing about my background and my experience is most people in the industry, they service one little area. So they're familiar with that area. Um, and with me, I service literally all over the United States and Canada. So a lot of experience of different housing, how houses are built, the different, you know, yellow jacket might act differently and have different behavior and habitats in a different state than, you know, vice versa. So if I, if you come to me, Stephen, and you do a ride along, say, yeah. I truly believe you spend all day and I just fill your brain with all this stuff. You're going to take back about 10% probably of that, that information. Use it on your job site because my housing structure is different because we have hurricanes here and flooding and, you know, just so many different things. The weather is different, but if I come to your place, then I have that experience of, of providing services there. So, you're going to get probably retain 60% of that um, education versus 10%. So you get a better bang for the dollar. Um, I think if you, if you have us come to you, then, you know, it's a little bit more expensive because of traveling. And sure. It, yeah. Well, someone has to pay the travel, either it's the student or it's you. So it's, well, yeah. Exactly. And that's that one of the other things is a lot of people can't take time off or, you know, a, a CEO can't take five guys off work for a week yeah. and to spend the day with me or a yeah. couple of days in hotels and fees, like you mentioned. Yeah. So yeah. you need to go there like that and uh, spend the day. So I can do up to 300 people in a day. Um, yeah, you know, that's a lot. Wow, that would be, yeah, that would be a bargain. So do you have what, do you do a little class time in the beginning and then do the ride alongs or do you just do, does it? depend on what the company wants to either mix and match some class time and then on-site time? Yeah, so I do a variety of different things. So every class right now is literally written just for that company that's requesting it. So each company has different needs. You know, Mm -hmm. they want their technicians to to learn how to treat better or how to market or how to um, perform extractions or something. So each course that I build, I literally build just for that company. And so it's a classroom, it could be ride alongs, it could be um, it could be hands-on, doing a big extraction with me. So there's a lot of different variety of things, you know. Right now, um, we're doing one that's almost like an undercover boss. Um, oh, okay. That's cool. Yeah. I'm going in for a company. Um and they think I'm just going in for, you know, to learn about pest control stuff. You know, they know who I am. Right. You know, I'm yeah. a guy. Kind of hard not to know who you are. Yeah. 
yeah. So I'm going in as I just learned. I want to learn more about general pest control, but I'm actually going to be critiquing and 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 uh, taking notes and and uh, like an undercover boss, and then cool. I'll take information back to the back to the CEO and say, "Yeah, this guy needs to stay. He needs a raise. He needs to go." You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, sometimes, uh, yeah, if I, having I've been let go from a job, and and sometimes it's. Uh, how was how did one guy phrase it? it? This wasn't my supervisor, but he's about one person said, um, you know, sometimes you, you need to help firing someone can also be a way to help them find their path. And, uh, you know, and I thought, you know, there's definitely some truth to that. <laughs> just, just within a couple of weeks ago, my pastor at church said that, uh, you know, everybody takes stuff personal in yeah. and some had to be fired and they took it personal and he says you know we didn't fire you because you're you was crappy at your job but you really was crappy at your job and sometimes you you are it's just not your sometimes you're just not getting it done yeah. yep, without a doubt so the online course do they learn about that on your website do they have a, a link there or is there another place where they go for the online course so right now um all points training um courses um is the only one that is carrying a course for us right at the moment so all I'm points gonna, training yeah all points training okay. they are uh what is that tennessee i believe all right um they do pest control training and certification gotcha. okay so, well, i want to give a shout out to all points training so those of you online who are interested in you know you want to maybe maybe get an introduction to this. This would might be a place to, for you to check out All Points Training. I would assume that it would be easily Googleable uh, uh, and check out uh, Eric's training on stinging insects there. Well, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. Yeah. How so, far are you booked out? How hard is it for someone to book you out to come out to your location, to their yeah, location? It, it, it varies, you know, it, it really does. Sometimes I'm really booked. I got um, I'm speaking at the Pennsylvania Pest Management Association um, conference in first of October or mm -hmm. first of November here yeah. in a couple on singing insects. Um, I'm speaking in February in Syracuse, New York, for Cornell University for the nice. food process workshop. Too bad you didn't get up there a little earlier to see some of the foliage. So, uh, oh, exactly. yeah. yeah. It's wary up there. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, I just got a lot of uh, a lot of training and a lot of conferences that I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. And what's the future for you? Where do you? Uh, a couple of things. What's the future for your company? And I want to get into the museum stuff here uh, shortly. But where do you see your company going in the next, let's say, ten years? And then where do you see the industry going in terms of your assessment? Uh, and you can even make it as narrow as the stinging insect management industry. Do you think? So where do you see it going in 10 years? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm always growing and always changing direction and, and uh, trying to find my niche, you know. And stinging insects is, of course, my niche. Mm. Now, uh, you know, I, I went from just performing bee removal and extractions to um, inventing traps, and stinging insect products, and product testing and and performing research which as a high school dropout i really never pictured myself doing scientific research but mm. that's where i'm at you know yeah. so um yeah so what where we determined now like this year we started um specializing in large complex issues dealing with stinging insects um and uh historical structures and landmarks so the last couple of years i've been doing a lot of uh, uh historical structures across the united states uh, primary from the 1600s to the 1800s okay. uh, doing a lot of structures taking bees out of and sin, stinging insects out of those structures Law, the large complex um, issues would be like um you know large um amusement parks mm -hmm. uh, Sports stadiums, city parks, you know, um, just very large, you know, managing, you know, right now, I think we're managing a few hundred acres of uh, land 
for seeing insect control. And so we're trying to specialize more in the large complex issues. Yeah. Yeah, Those growth. companies are looking for uh, what liability, just trying to reduce liability on stinging insects because what the hornets or wasps are looking for sugar and fat in the trash yeah. cans and things like that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, to just be quite blunt and honestly, that's, they're just liability is yeah. their concern. They're not really caring about saving, saving the bees or, or this or that. Their concern is if somebody gets stung and die, they want to be able to say, we have a program and in, in check or yeah. responsible for it. So I like a challenge. I like to do things that no one else is doing. Um, and so, you know, specializing in a large complex and the, in the, in the historical structures is very cool because uh, I have a lot of experience growing up in Pennsylvania, um, a lot of historical structures there. Mm -hmm. And then living in Charleston, South Carolina, is, it's one of the oldest cities in America. Yep. So I work on 17 year old, you know, 1700, excuse me, 1700 structures yeah. every day wow. yeah. um so um i just like having that experience and that background here so the order i get and the more we get into the career um you know probably within the next five years i'll be pulling myself out of the field okay. and taking more of a administration position and uh and things so You're gonna be happy with that you know, I don't know, you know, <laughs> okay. pushing 50 now, I got over yeah. 30 in the industry. I don't know. Uh, I mean, being, being in a swarm of bees, it sounds crazy, Stephen, but it's one of the happiest places I've ever been in my life. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. But, okay. You know, All right. Well, fair, fair enough. You don't. It's fun. Yeah. I mean, can somebody do bee extractions in their fifties and sixties? Absolutely. Sure. You know? Yeah. But the wear and tear that I've done on my own body in mm -hmm. the last few years of doing this and liking it, you know, so that's where people coming in the industry and people that's already here, I think I'm a, I'm a important asset as in learn from my experience and from my, you know, I can, I can teach you and train you in a few hours or in a couple of days, what it took me literally 30 years yeah, yeah I, I think people miss that. And I also just want to emphasize, I've said this before on previous podcasts, but just talking to everybody out there, you know, your plan for your future. I mean, when you're in the early go-go years, you're pulling in sometimes a lot of money. Those of you in good markets uh, plan for your future because your body can wear out. And so it protects your body. I think some of my knee problems, I, but definitely I should have been more mindful of my needs and, you know, you think of hearing, you know, the dealing with power tools, just the safety stuff. Yeah. It slows you down, but it may extend your career longer and certainly a lot less pain and definitely think about that. Yeah. I actually, I mean, good health yeah. um, in the past and throughout my career when I was doing wildlife, um, I was sick a lot, you know, I had, 13 zoonic diseases, a couple of them almost killed me. You know, I was on my deathbed, um, falling off ladders, falling through a roof. I mean, jumping off roofs and you think you're He-Man and uh, it catches up. Your body remembers all that. Oh, it, it does. What, what were some of the zoonotics that you got? Um, Do you remember I mean, any? I mean, one of the, one of the worst ones was uh, spinal meningitis from a possum. Ooh. Yeah, I got uh, tuberculosis from a raccoon. Um, really? Smear. Yeah, so I've had 13 documented uh, zoonic diseases. Wow. And most people don't realize, uh, of course, you're knowledgeable enough that, you know, a lot of these guys probably have had them, but they're more like a common cough or a flu or, yeah, you know. Yeah, body fought it off. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. I, uh, no. you know. We have, yeah, I think a lot more, like, you know, think of hantavirus, you know, I mean, deer mice are basically across the country, and you think of how many different situations, they're in buildings a lot more than what people realize, 
you know, you're crawling through stuff. And, you know, did you remember to wear the respirator? Did, or did yeah. you, you know, think, oh, it's no big deal. And then you, you know, several weeks later, you're not feeling all that good. Is it the flu? Is it, was it Hanta? I mean, who knows, right? I mean, that's. That's funny to say back in the, in the um, late 80s, early 90s um, for back cleanup. I've never told anybody this, but, you know, I don't think I have, but, you know, I used to just take toilet paper and roll it up and stick it in my nose and go do a full attic cleanup oh. for back. You know, oh, my okay. life, you know, Whew, for yeah. 40, yeah. 40 years I did a back, I did back one and clean out and full insulation, fiberglass insulation replacement without a respirator. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yes. Well, definitely. If we want to learn, um, don't don't yeah. do don't don't do as we did, folks. Um, it, but, it's wear but, your respirator, wear your PPE. Be careful out there, without it, without a doubt. Well, we're glad you're uh, you're still with us, and it looks like you're doing well. Uh, let's talk about your museum. You know, you yeah. have the pest control. You have a pest control museum, the Cools Pest Control Museum. Uh, the pictures I've seen of it must be quite the place. So I guess you have to move it now is the last posting I saw. It looks like you're, you are got to move it. Yeah. So uh, a couple of years ago, I opened what is believed to be the, the first uh, pest control museum um, in the nation. I opened it up in Franklin, Pennsylvania. Um, very successful. It is the largest known collection of uh, pest control items. So um, Orkin has their own little museum of their artifacts and their mm -hmm. little headquarters there. But this collection here, I have literally thousands and thousands of items. I think we're up to 10 or 11,000 items. Mm. Very large collection of That's amazing. Special items. So what the collection contains is about 155 years of history. So back in the mid, mid 1800s, um, fly swatters, um, rat poison, bed bug poison, um, dust sprayers, rodent traps. And so um, how I started the museum actually is throughout my career, I would find something in the attic or a call. <laughs> yep. I'm like, what is this rusty old thing? I'm like, oh, it has a bed bug on it. So mm -hmm. I'd sit at my desk. And so my desk filled up and I put it in a container on the side mm -hmm. and another container and collected for 30 years. So I woke up one day and my girlfriend at the time was like, just throw all that stuff away. Yeah. It, it just, what are you doing with it? I'm like, I have no idea. So I literally woke up one morning and I said, a museum. So I did some research and, and looked around and there wasn't one. And I'm like, wow. So if you think about it, when somebody passes on or um, somebody's parents die or they move or anything like that, the first thing they do is clean out underneath the sink and the garage, the basement. They throw all the chemicals away. So no one's ever really preserved the pest control industry, you know, at all. So here I have thousands of items even at that time. So I opened the museum up and uh, it has a history of pest control, it has a lot of wildlife control stuff in there as well. Mm -hmm. You know, animal traps and, and, you know, I got like a, I don't know. I just got so much stuff. It's amazing. Yeah, 10, I didn't realize it was that big, 10 to 11,000 items. So that is just, wow. Uh, so, and how much space do you need? To hold yeah, all that. So, um, that the building that we was in in Pennsylvania was fifty five hundred square foot. Whew. Yeah, it was a pretty big building. Um, I have nest in there. Um, I just started creating a a honeybee um, portion of it, a beekeeping museum on the side of that as well. So mm -hmm. a lot of vintage beekeeping stuff from the eighteen hundreds and now as well. So. Uh, you know, it started out with just my collection, and then I started buying some things mm -hmm. offline, auctions, mm -hmm. and stuff. And now, within the last three or four years now, the wildlife and pest control owners and technicians and people retiring, they're starting to donate stuff. And I had a, I had a tremendous uh, 
donation last year from Eric Smith, Dr. Eric H. Smith in Virginia. Okay. Uh, I had a very large donation of um, Dr. Uh, Arnold Malice, um, which is the Malice Handbook. Yeah, the Malice Handbook. So I have a lot of his original work. You know, oh, my from goodness. First thing he wrote in college, his first college papers to booklets to from his library. I have a lot of his original books from the 1800s, um, early 1900s on pest control. So and entomology so it's a tremendous collect i mean it's the collection is truly priceless I yeah, mean, I, that's that is an amazing thing so are you looking to ultimately merge your museum with a university because typically when you're looking at a scholar like malice they would usually contribute their their items to a university and become part of the you know the archive be the malice archive at that museum so is that something down the road for you and yeah you know so i've had a hard uh decision on this i was going to um start a uh a, a museum advisory board mm -hmm. um to get direction and where i wanted to take this because honestly it's a lot for me to to take <laughs> on i i have about thousand dollars of my own money in, invested in this project just yeah. in the museum yeah. Yeah. so uh, you know i thought about that you know we was thinking maybe like um work in our terminex or somebody would you know offer up a, a building and some money or something and and so there's a lot of different scenarios that could happen even making it a non-profit uh, and, and stuff so I'm not really sure. Eventually, I'd like to make it like the the National Pest Control Museum of, yeah. of or something. You know, I really think it's a true asset to the industry and to America. You know, um, there's nothing like it even around the world that I'm aware of, and it continues to grow. Uh, literally every week, I get something in the mail um, that I bought or somebody donated, and it's it's amazing the stuff yeah no i think i think you're exactly right i think at times in our industry we're at a we're at a point now where if we don't preserve our our history it'll be gone uh and that's certainly in the wildlife control field i mean obviously your 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 vision's bigger than you know my history obviously in terms of wildlife control but i've i've had that same thought in the wildlife control industry because we've had founders who are starting to get you know, let's, we're all, we're all heading to the, to one direction here, folks, without getting too morbid, but, and we need to be thinking about how are we preserving that history to just, just as a way of honoring people that have started this industry and, and just realizing where we've come from, you know, sometimes, you know, we criticize people for doing techniques, this or that, uh, but we realize that, you know, we, we didn't get where we're at without learning from them. Yeah. You know, and that without them, and so sometimes we get a little, you know, I would say a little uppity with with people before us without really respecting the fact of what we're here because of what they learned and we were able to step on their shoulders and move forward. And and we need to preserve that. And otherwise it's gone. I I do it with photographs typically, you know, taking pictures at conferences and people and um you know, it's that stuff's valuable. And so I would want to encourage the viewers here, you know, if you have some uh, materials that would be useful for this museum, definitely consider contributing. We just want to make sure this stuff is preserved, you know, follow the regulations when you're shipping stuff, folks, you know, you have to be careful of all that, but make sure, but we want to preserve this material. And I would, um, uh, that would be very important. Yeah, so I would you. hope, yeah, I would really hope that maybe the National Pest Control Association, maybe NUCOA, maybe do something that bridges both both industries, and then you get maybe some students that would start coming in and doing research, you know, historical research on stuff. Just that uh, that that's really important. So I'm really glad you're doing it. It's one of those things that we even thought about a virtual museum online, you know, and and you know, taking pictures of the, of the product and you can look yep. at it and description and all that, but 
there's so many items and it would take so much time and effort. Would. Yeah. Me funding it all. So you'd want to go for a grant. That's where you're at a point now where you have to decide whether you make it a nonprofit or make it a separate corporation. Yeah, you're at a you're kind of maybe at a tipping point here. Uh, otherwise, you could make it a commercial endeavor and try to have it self-sustaining with people paying to visit, you know, and then you start thinking of sponsors. Yeah, you've got, I didn't realize it was that big when you said 10 to 11,000 items. It's like, whew, yeah, that's yeah, a lot to move. <laughs> I, I hate yeah. moving, so I do not envy you at all. <laughs> it's something that I wanted to touch base on, too, that about the wildlife control industry. So. You know, the wildlife and the pest control industry it has always been separate. And right. I remember when I was I was getting out of the wildlife control industry, I retired from, I call it retired out of the industry about three years ago. And when I started going over to the pest control industry, they're like, trader or like, <laughs> oh, what's going on, you know? And I'm like, what? Yeah. And then it's both of those slowly merging together and, you know, yeah. Both industries are kind of providing some of the same services now, yeah. you know, and so I've had that vision, like, um, even in my museum, I have some of the first WCT magazines, mm -hmm. I have um, a lot of original, so when NACOA started, they actually had the, each state has had a chapter, they had, instead of regions, they had state chapters, Right. I was actually a president of Pennsylvania's chapter back then, and so like original letterhead and all that i kept all my records wow so i have some of some old you know critter control had a a newsletter called critter chatter yeah something. yeah you know some of those i'm wondering if i yeah. have any of those around yeah I so I have them and uh yeah i just have some some cool old things that i i've kept for the museum as well from the wildlife control industry all right and any, right. any NADCA or I mean any probes yeah. and he got yeah. some probes too okay all right yeah, oh, yeah. how about yeah, the vertebrate pest conference manuals do you have any of yeah. those yep yeah. you have some of those all right because I have I have several of the hard copies are all it's all digital now so I have several of the hard copy and be able to ask you if you have any if, if you need those maybe I can ship the ones I have out to you if you don't have those numbers so um that way you have them in hard copy so yeah. it'd be kind of yeah. cool. I'll... Right beside me, I have all all your books. All my books. Oh dear. Okay. <laughs> and, and I even, one I even helped you on a little bit. There you go. Yeah, the practical yeah. guide of the. I'm glad you have that one. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I thought I that one to... would sell better than it did. <laughs> it, it did not. I was thinking that was going to be my breakout one. I actually have the. I have your new one being kind of animal pest, but I actually have the original one as well. Yeah, I have the original one. Yep, I've, uh, I, I, I wrote to, I wrote to Steve, but I wanted, I sent him the revised edition and said, you know, if you wanted to make some comments on it, and I, I it didn't, uh, he, I don't recall him commenting on it, but I figured I, but I sent him a. Yeah. sent him a manuscript, I believe. So yeah, that was, uh, I bought that. He, he sold that to critter control okay. and critter control didn't do anything with it and i learned that they had it and i said well i'll buy it off it so they they sold it to me and then i just revised it so now i'm working on frishman's frishman's book but uh enough about okay. enough about all that but well so you you have uh, the last thing we haven't spoken about really was your you just mentioned it briefly was your you said you're doing some more research. Is there anything that you're uh, able to talk about or is some of that uh, not not far enough along or is there, you know, we don't want to have you break any confidentiality rules or anything like that, so. Yeah, so I do a lot of product testing and research for other manufacturers and, okay. and some pest control companies, um, but I do a lot on my own as well. So mm -hmm. uh, I announced a while back that I was I had created my own brand of bee suits. Right. Uh, when I, we had a manufacturer, a prototype, everything was ready to go, and then COVID hit. Right. And I actually lost my manufacturer. And uh, since then, going on, wow, almost two years now, I guess, um, I had the prototypes. 
literally hanging beside me. Um, but I don't have a manufacturer yet. So that's pending release. So now we're, you know, I looked at all these stinging insect traps um, and wasp traps and other, everything made by these various companies that I can't name. Right. Uh, but they're all seasonal. They're all disposable, cheaply made and all that. So I'm always buying traps or and doing this or buying that. And I got that because when you're in the wildlife control industry, I create a lot of my own things, you know. Mm. You know, we didn't have wildlife control supply. Did not have that today, no. How are you still out in the field? So right. we, we didn't have that right away. So we had to create a lot of our own products and, and tools and stuff. So that's what I do. And I'm like, why don't I create my own line of products? So I just developed a, I really think it's a game changer um, bee trap that is going to be used it can be used commercial, but it's or residential, but it's probably going to be more commercial and used for large scale things and gas stations and stuff. But it's a long term trap. The trap will last you probably fifteen or twenty years. Okay. Uh, yeah, very long term, very unique trap. Um, I've made uh, five of them right now. They are in product testing, doing extremely well. So I'm going to produce two hundred more next week and uh hopefully i'll put them 200 out on my job sites throughout the united states and, uh, if everything goes well within the next month or two we can release them for sale in the spring of next year wow okay so if people have uh their own products they want to have tested they can contact you for some testing materials for testing work as well so well, you are you are involved in a lot, so that is amazing. Well, is there anything else that uh, we haven't covered that you'd like to send out to the to the virtual world here? Yeah, I just uh, you know I think if you're getting into to stinging insects at all, um, follow me on Facebook. I have a a group that you can follow. I post a lot of of. Uh, things on there, pictures and information and videos and all that. Learn learn what you're doing. Just don't provide a service because you think you can or you can make a dollar. Have your heart into it. Uh, learn what you're doing. Stinging insects, um, there's, there's money in it. I mean, there's a good profit margin in stinging insect control. Um, but it's probably the biggest liability that you can have as well on a job site. Um, even doing live removal because um, you got two types of people in the world. You got half the population that thinks they're allergic to bees, and the other half don't want stung by it. You know, so but if you're providing a good quality service professionally, you never have a problem. You know, and uh, it's taken me all over the United States, all over Canada. I train and consult for companies all around the world now and uh, who would have ever thought just for bees um, so um, I think you will see most companies doing live removal or um, referring that to a live removal within the next probably 10 years mm. I think you're really going to see a big sway of, of change there and I am looking at um some different, um, some new, I don't know how to say it without letting the cat out of the Oh, bag. sure. Yep. New products or, products or techniques may be coming soon. Yeah, yeah, products and techniques coming soon. Coming soon, how about that? Yeah, well, good, well, I hope, I hope when they do come out or you're ready to announce them, I do hope you'd consider coming back on the show and we'll, I'd love to announce them here and get them, get them out to our, to our audience, so. Uh, I really appreciate your time here, Eric. It's been sort of a going down memory lane here and seeing what your career has been been doing. It's been quite a storied career. Yeah, yours has been pretty great too. You know? All right. Well, appreciate that. So uh, as we're wrapping up here, everyone, this is uh, Eric McCool, uh, a, a true legend for anyone who's been paying attention for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, Critter, the owner, the president and owner of Critter McCool Management Group. He has a 
stinging insect removal portion of his company. He has a museum with 10 to 11,000 items. If you have items in the pest control world that have historical worth, or even if you're in doubt, you know, I think you take a picture of it, send it to Eric, see if it's something he'd want to add to his collection. Let's preserve our heritage. That includes the wildlife control side as well. He has, uh, he does bee extractions, of course, and he does training, whether uh, online with all points training out of Tennessee, you can contact them for his online training, but he also does on site training, he does conferences ride alongs, you can come to him if you wish work out and in if you have ideas for products or services that you want to have him test, he is available for that as well so. Wow, uh, there is a, certainly a lot there. So crittermccool.com is how you can get in touch with them or you can reach him out, reach out to him on Facebook. He does have a page there. Well, that is our show today, everyone. Really glad you stayed along and hope you grabbed some, you know, some historical knowledge about how someone started from really basically nothing and was able to establish a pretty a pretty impressive company in a very niche field of stinging insect work. Uh, this is important for both historical purposes and realizing that even the challenges that you have in front of you, there's probably a way to get it, to get over that just with enough perseverance and grit to work through it and people that help you along. Well, this is Living the Wildlife podcast. Again, take a few moments, subscribe to our channel. If you have ideas for future shows, definitely reach out to me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Love to hear your comments. And remember, everyone, this is Living the Wildlife. Why? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everybody.